the faces of 10-year-old murderers. Tonight, the first new pictures of Thompson and Venables, new revelations about their years in custody and threats to hunt them down if they're released. It's eight years since two ten-year-old boys murdered James Bolger. The anger is still there. I am fully and utterly in favour of doing anything to keep those lunatics, those evil, wicked, vile people into prison, Thompson and Venables. I don't think they have been punished in any shape or form. They have not served a long sentence. They have not been treated like criminals. It's a regular topic on Pete Price's phone-in, and the response is always the same. Hello, Leslie. Hiya, Pete. Hiya, Leslie. What can we do Hi. for you? Um, oh, where do we start, Pete, again? What do we do with them? We keep them locked up for life. Because at the end of the day, it's Ralph and Denise and the rest of their families and friends that are doing a life sentence, not them, Pete. Thank you very much for talking to us, Leslie. Let's go to another call. Hi, Paul. We should have been uh, hung and uh, put in jibbers. Really? You would have hung two little ten-year-old boys? Yeah. Well, when they were old enough to uh, appreciate the punishment. So you would have waited till they got older and then hung them? Yeah. So you kept them locked up and then hung them? Yeah. All right, Paul, thank you very much for that. Give us a ring, 015147209. The two killers are now eligible for parole and Pete Price is among those campaigning to keep them locked up. Public opinion seems firmly on his side. It's a very emotive subject for people of Kirby, and I'm sure for the rest of Liverpool. I can't ever begin to think how two children of that age could actually partake in the evil that they did. These pictures of Robert Thompson and John Venables have never been seen before. Taken at the time they were charged, they're also the last pictures you're allowed to see. A court order means more recent ones can't be shown. We can't speak to anyone involved in their care or custody or say where they're held. The legal restrictions mean very little hard information has ever emerged about Thompson and Venables in the last eight years. Recently, the Lord Chief Justice said they'd made remarkable progress. But how do we know? How has the system dealt with ten-year-old murderers? What treatment have they had? Are they still dangerous? Up until now, we've only heard from those who want to keep them locked up for life. So tonight, we take a deeper look at their time in custody. And some of what we found is so controversial, it's not surprising it's been kept quiet. The secrecy is in stark contrast to the very public way this case unfolded. We all recognise the images. The Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle, a young child being led away by two older boys. Police hoped it was just teenagers messing around and two-year-old James would be returned safely. Denise, what is your, your appeal to the public? If you've got me baby to bring them back. For two days, the hunt for James dominated the news, and it seemed the whole country shared the Bulger's anguish. Then a group of boys playing on the railway line found a child's body. James had been cut in half by a train. Well, it's fairly obvious that from the pattern of injuries that he hadn't been killed by the train. I mean, he'd been run over by the train, but he had a, a lot of head injuries, so it was, we weren't dealing with a train death. 
So tell me what, what the post-mortem established then about the injuries. The post-mortem showed that he had a lot of what are called split wounds or lacerations mainly to his head, which were the result of being struck heavy blows with the bricks and the iron bar that were found at the scene. A two-year-old battered to death, apparently by other children, it seemed impossible to believe. Over the next few days, about 60 youngsters were questioned. Then police were tipped off about two younger boys, truanting from school when James went missing. So when they said 10-year-old boys, you think, oh well, it's got to be done. The information's come in, so we've got to go and see him and interview him. But you were expecting them. That, that, you know, they could possibly be the ones? Oh, no, I didn't. I don't think the other detectives did as well. Phil Roberts led the team that arrested Robert Thompson. He lived a few hundred yards from where James's body had been found. Robert came down. He was neat, tidy, clean, ready for school. So I thought, oh, well, I've got to tell him. So I sat him down on the sofa. I went down on my knees, sort of eye-to-eye -eye contact. I said, Robert, I'm here because of James' murder. He says, yeah, no. He said, but we've been told that you might be involved in it. Then he started sort of panicking, sort of crying, but not crying with tears, just no tears, but crying. He was afraid more than anything. Robert was taken to Walton Lane Police Station. His mother went with him. A couple of miles away, on the Norris Green estate, another team arrested John Venables and took him to Lower Lane Police Station. The first thing I noticed about John is that he looked far younger than the ten years that he was uh, in actual fact, he looked like an eight-year-old, little cherubic, angelic-looking face, supported by his mum, who was a nice, polite person. Would never have dreamt that he could be capable of a crime like this. Robert was just remarkably young. That would be the first thing that struck you. He was younger, perhaps, than anybody you'd ever seen in a custodial setting before, let alone the seriousness of the offence. He was just so small. He was clearly very vulnerable. Um, uh, that's the, that's the, the clearest memory I have of it, just seeing someone so small, so young, in among so many adults in such a uh, difficult situation. Public anger was almost unprecedented. There was a near riot the first time the two appeared in court. Nine months after the killing, a formal Crown Court trial. The accused, known only as A and B. Back in 1993, the law assumed that a child of between 10 and 14 didn't always know right from wrong. The prosecution had to prove they did. So the trial hinged not on whether they killed James, there was never much doubt about that, but whether they fully understood that taking him away from his mother and battering him to death was seriously wrong. That was all the legal system needed to know. The jury found them guilty of murder, and for juveniles there's only one sentence, to be detained during Her Majesty's pleasure. The judge then made a decision which has become a major factor in this case. He identified the boys. Their school photographs are now recognized by almost everyone in the country. But at the same time, the judge ordered that no details of their future in custody could be revealed. It means Thompson and Venables will always be remembered but only as murderers. However they've changed, whatever progress they've made, that's been kept secret.
St Mary's Church of England Primary School in Liverpool. Eight months before John Venables and Robert Thompson became murderers. They're now 18, but they're fixed in the public mind as ten-year-old monsters, evil freaks of nature. Any other views, especially in Liverpool, tend to stay hidden. I, I didn't look upon Robert as, as being evil. You know, as in my eyes and what I seen of Robert, he was a normal little boy that got up to mischievous things like every other little boy. Her son was also at St Mary's, one of Robert's few friends. Much of the time, the pair of them truanted. I used to take him to school. I'd put him in one gate and he'd sneak out the other gate without me knowing. Uh, I then found out that they used to go to the shops, pinch biscuits and sweets, and they had a den, but I don't know where the den was. And they also played on the railway track. She knew her son was out of control, but didn't know what to do about it. At times, the boys roamed around until after midnight. I just couldn't find them. I used to walk the streets looking for them, and, you know, I just couldn't find them anyway. I was worried, but I didn't inform the police because I thought if I inform the police, then the welfare come on your back. And before you know it, that's it. So, you know, I just sort of, you know, plodded on and just hoped that he was all right. Robert Thompson's mother felt the same. She didn't want social services interfering. But her son, indeed her whole family, was far from all right. I think, ironically, that uh, the Roberts family were uh, emerging from a terrible, terrible period of chaos. Um, uh, but it was too late for Robert. Robert's father had left the home about four years earlier amid great drama and trauma. His mother was drinking heavily at that time. Robert was the fifth of six children and I think there was quite a lot of bullying going down the ages and uh, Robert was kind of at the bottom of the pile. The family which was desperate for help. It was fragile, it was damaged, it was vulnerable. Um, you have a ten-year-old boy at his primary school with just on half of his education missing because of truant. It was apparent that nothing formally had been done about that. John Venables had only joined the school that year. He was moved from Broad Square Junior where his behaviour had become worse and worse. His teacher said John used to revolve along the walls, pulling down work. He'd curl up under a group of desks so no one could reach him. He stuck paper all over his face. He cut himself with scissors and also cut holes in his socks. Finally, he tried to choke another boy with a ruler across his throat. It's always seemed to me that John displayed many more signs of being, you know, seriously behaviourally disturbed. He had a, an older brother and a younger sister. They both had learning difficulties of attending a special school. His parents had quite an unstable relationship. They'd been separated for a while. I think, uh, again, in the months before the murder, they were attempting some kind of reconciliation. Instability is always very difficult for children to deal with. So moving school was seen as giving John a fresh start. Instead, it brought him together with Robert Thompson. They were two small boys from difficult families running wild together, but they appeared no different to countless other children until they murdered James Bulger. They were ten years old when they were first locked up. The public expected them to be punished for their horrific crime. But children under 15 can't go to prison. They go instead to secure units run by local authorities. These youngsters may have committed serious crimes or be at risk of harming themselves because they're out of control. 
for the majority of young people, coming to secure accommodation is a huge shock. There is a bravado as they walk through the door because that's what a teenager would expect. They will walk in, they will strut in sometimes. Some of them come in crying, some of them are brought in kicking and screaming. But the reality is that once they're in secure accommodation, they have become quickly aware that the adults are in control of their lives. And that, for the first four or five days, or indeed longer, can be a huge shock. Often youngsters arrive with very little structure in their lives. They've, what I would describe as lived on the margins of society in the sense that they don't go to school, they're out late at night. The whole kind of day is, is, is different from everybody else's day. They've often arrived with very poor health backgrounds, no educational achievement records, and sometimes even as basic as they don't know how to brush their teeth. These are children's homes, not prisons, and the emphasis is on welfare. The days are tightly organised, normal school hours, meals at set times, at night they're locked in their rooms. There are also regular sessions with psychiatrists to try and change the attitudes and behaviour which led to them getting into trouble. We've got a system of secure accommodation which is one of the best in Europe. We know we've got effective treatment and we know it works. The outcomes, uh, we can also predict those children who are likely not to benefit and likely to remain at risk in the long term. But for the majority who are amenable to treatment, the outcome is good. Leon McEwen was 13 when he was sentenced to five years for arson. He ended up in the same secure unit as Robert Thompson. Leon knew who he was, although it was never discussed. I had an idea because I read the papers and listened to the news and that's all. I didn't really want to hear it, what he did from his mouth because I just thought I was sick. And were you ever there when there were any stories on the news about the killing? Or... Yeah. Uh, like one time we was all just sat there and it come up on the news, I can't remember what it was about, it showed you his picture and I can remember the staff turned it off and he went like barging into his room and you could hear him like arguing with the staff, I can't remember what he was saying, he was just swearing at him and stuff like that. We can't say where Thompson or Venables are held for legal reasons but they're not in any of the units shown in this programme. The regime in all of them is similar. Thompson, like everyone else, has his own room. His room was probably like the packed one out of the whole unit because he was there so long. We had like Liverpool posters. We had like pictures with like lava painted like matchstick people and stuff like that. And he had like a Liverpool duvet. Just had, had a foot spa in his room and like if he was lending the PC from education, he used to have that in his room as well for do his work on. And I heard maybe that he did cook meals for other people sometimes. Do you yeah, know? he used to cook meals for his like his family. Like if he had a visit, like at seven o'clock, he used to take his family down to like the education bit, like the cooking like class. And like his family used to sit there while he used to cook him a meal. All these revelations will undoubtedly add to the outrage in Liverpool, where people already feel James Bulger's killers have been pampered, not punished. Certainly the facilities in secure units are excellent, but keeping children locked up like this is expensive. On average it costs somewhere in the region of £3,000 a week, but I regard that as an investment for the future. If I can affect positive change in a youngster, return them safely to the community, then perhaps we won't spend large sums of money by incarcerating them for the, for the majority of their adult life. But for an awful lot of people, especially the victims of crime, they're not interested in any of that. They simply want to know where is the punishment. I think by locking up a young person, 13, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
by restricting their liberty for a period of months and sometimes years. You are doing that. Even if you lock them up with an all-weather football pitch, a swimming pool, a gymnasium, but a game part, boy, those a are, television. Those are part of the, those are part of the things that, 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 that young people need in order to develop a sense of worth. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to lock a young person up? Lock them up in an environment that brutalises them, that actually restricts their liberty in a sense that is negative? Or do you want me to affect positive change so that at the end of the process, young people come out having made progress and change and less likely to commit further offences? So the punishment is being locked up, but even that's not straightforward. Hi, have an evening news. Thank you very much. Great, thanks a lot. Recently, public anger has been stoked up again by a number of press stories. Oh, OK, so this is Venables, and it's saying that he's been released several times from his secure unit with his father to go to Old Trafford. And they're saying that he's also allowed out once a week to play football against teams of local schoolboys who don't know his identity. Stories started appearing as soon as it became clear the killers were eligible for parole this summer. Robert Thompson has apparently been to a Manchester shopping centre. But we've discovered he's been shopping quite often. In fact, he's been coming out for years. It's called mobility. Mobility is time out of the secure unit and can take a number of forms. The unit, in the unit that I manage, mobility is always supervised by at least one member of my staff team. And that will, in a typical young person, will start with a small amount of mobility and perhaps build up to more extensive mobility. Its purpose is to prepare a young people from moving from a very enclosed, secure environment back into the community. So it will take place in the latter stages of their sentence. But according to our research, Robert Thompson got his first taste of freedom little over a year into his sentence. This is Rivington Pike in Lancashire. Early in 1995, Robert came here for a long walk, supervised by staff from the unit. Like all mobility, it had to be specifically approved in advance by the Home Office. And this was just the beginning of regular trips out, which until now have been kept absolutely secret. In 1996, Robert began monthly visits to a sports centre. We just used to go swimming with the staff and come back about three hours later. Just used to stack yourself, so we went swimming at the McDonald's or whatever. I used to know we went out because, like I used to say to the staff, oh, where have you been? He used to say, oh, I've been to the shopping centre with, with him, stuff like that, or to the park with him or whatever. Robert also likes going to garden centres, and it's not unusual now for him to leave the unit at least once a week. According to our investigation, he's been all over northern England. From Sellafield in Cumbria down to Jodrell Bank in Cheshire. He's had days out in Chester and in York. Over the years, Robert Thompson's trips have got longer and further afield, in line with standard policy on mobility. Sometimes it can involve simply starting off with perhaps an hour out of the unit and having a walk in a local park, moving up to perhaps going to uh, following some educational type program where they might go to a local museum to complete work that they've been undertaking education, perhaps to a local shopping centre to buy the clothes that they need from the money that they're allowed. And that's, that's about letting them, that's about preparing them for a return into the community. It's about promoting independent skills. It's about allowing them just to handle some kind of On one hand, it appears a sensible and humane policy. You can't lock children away for all their formative years and expect they'll just slot back into society rehabilitated. But when those children are James Bulger's murderers, it's not surprising the Home Office won't talk about it. Is there a real sensitivity about discussing mobility? It sounds like the government, the Home Office, 
They would really rather people didn't talk about this. They really don't want people to know exactly what's going on. Well, I'm sure that the government and the Home Office have uh, very real security concerns when it comes to discussing mobility, particularly the detail of, of mobility in these individual cases. Is it I, I respect those concerns. Is it a question of actually of embarrassment that they really don't want to admit that having locked up young offenders, we do let them out again? I, I don't know what the motivation is, but I think it's, it, it's clear that there are real security concerns. Whether that's the, the prime motivation, I, I can't say. In the end, the only justification for this policy of welfare rather than punishment will be, has it worked? How much have Robert Thompson and John Venables changed in the last eight years? The first progress that I could see was academic, that he was doing very well at school, he was doing well with his, particularly with his arithmetic, and his English was very good. And um, you may say that uh, he was a captive audience, as it were, didn't have the same distractions as a schoolboy uh, at large um, would have. Robert Thompson has also caught up on his education. We've discovered he's taken GCSEs in English, Maths, History, Science and Textiles, and he's since gone on to pass A-levels. Last year, the Lord Chief Justice said the killers had now served enough time to punish them they shouldn't be sent to the harsher environment of a young offenders institute because that would undo all the good work that's changed them almost beyond recognition. In my personal opinion, one adjective to describe him that stands out about him more than perhaps about anybody else, he is a remarkably thoughtful young man for a man of his age. Careful, thoughtful, considerate of other people's feelings. To a degree that is in my view, exceptional amongst 18-year-old people. But is it time to let them out? We've discovered the parole board will meet next week to decide if Robert Thompson and John Venables are still dangerous. If they're released, James Bulger's father has said they'll be hunted down. And people may already be making plans to do just that. Gentlemen, thank you once again for coming out. I, I'm angry and I'm here today because I think they're taking the mickey out of us. You're here with children today. Are... DJ Pete Price is among several well-known Merseysiders who support the Justice for James campaign. The aim is to keep Thompson and Venables locked up. Little bits of information are being fed out. How can they say that these two boys have been punished? They have not been punished in any shape or form yet. And that is what is wrong. At the forefront of the campaign, James's mother, Denise. They've always had the backing of the popular press. That's helped by the fact that another organiser, Chris Johnson, runs a news agency in Liverpool. He's also Denise's press agent. Walk a bit slower. I thought you were going down the aisle. They know time is running out. The killers could be released this summer. The campaign to stop that is picking up pace. They shouldn't be allowed out, should they? Do you know what they were doing? Ten year olds all here and I don't know what it's good to, what's good, what's bad, so they shouldn't be allowed out. Do you not accept that maybe in eight years and with a lot of professional help they might have changed? No, no. You'll always be bad, won't they? Always. I think, like, justice hasn't been saved with them. So I think, like, they need to go in the big jail. Because I think they're being treated with cotton wool at the moment. You can't have given this example that if you go out and horribly murder a child or somebody, then you'll get the education that you should have got anyway. And then you'll get all of these things set up for you in life to make it easy for you. It shouldn't be about them coming out. I think my main concern is that um, they probably could still be a danger and certainly people who commit evil crimes, at what stage do you believe that they won't reoffend?
The view that Robert Thompson is still violent has been fueled by two recent press stories. An official looking report describing a fight was in fact a complete forgery which Scotland Yard is now investigating. There never was a fight. There was a scuffle with another boy, but he turns out to have been a drug addict who provoked the argument and then sold his story to the press. In terms of the press interest, uh, these two boys continue to be demonised and uh, there is a, you know, a kind of vengeful mood around the case which I feel that the newspapers do a lot to stoke. I've always felt that uh, people needed to put those two boys um, out of the frame of human reference that uh, it was so difficult to imagine any child of ours committing such a crime that people had to kind of uh, describe them as evil, to dismiss them almost. Um, and uh, that, you know, there was a need for them to be demonised and made us feel better. There's always been talk that they mutilated James and sexually abused him. After eight years, those rumours have suddenly been spelled out in the press. The injuries described were absolutely horrific. We checked every detail with the pathologist who did the post-mortem, and none of this is true. There are a lot of opinions which are held by people about this offence which are inaccurate as to what happened, as to what was done which caused me uh, an enormous amount of concern as to, as to why the public seemed to want to bring those stories into existence when the crime itself was bad enough. To me, it seems to devalue the crime and the life that was taken to try and make it worse, as though that were not bad enough. In contrast to the false press stories, the real developments have taken place quietly. Both Thompson and Venables have had years of regular and difficult sessions with psychiatrists. John has described having flashbacks where he saw James bleeding on the ground. He's also had nightmares where he dreamed of giving birth to somehow bring James back to life. Two years after the trial, when he blamed it all on Robert, John Venables admitted his guilt. A serious crime inflicts tremendous hurt and damage on other people and part of the process is that the young person has to take that on board and acknowledge it, taking on the responsibility for their actions, but most painfully taking on the emotional consequences uh, of their actions. And that's a very difficult and painful thing for anybody. Robert Thompson lost faith with his first psychiatrist and demanded a new doctor. But he wouldn't open up to her until she agreed to an extraordinary deal. She'd only write down minimum details of what he told her. Only then did he also admit killing James. He still wouldn't talk freely because he said it wasn't sorted out in his own head. It was five years after the murder before Robert finally expressed remorse for what he'd done. The psychiatrist's views will carry great weight when Thompson and Venables appear before the parole board next week. There'll also be detailed reports on every aspect of their lives in custody. Is this a particularly difficult case, do you think? Yes. With the extent of the media coverage, it's a real hot potato. And how much is that going to affect their decision? Shouldn't. Shouldn't affect it at all. They should concentrate on the evidence they have before them in the dossier and the impression they form of the individual who is making the application before them. And, and what is your brief? I mean, what are you trying to get at? To assess the dangerousness of release. If there is any danger, then we would not be in a position to recommend release. We've got to be satisfied that um, the prisoner can safely rejoin society. Pete Price unzipped. Call now. 0151. Safety cuts two ways. Would Thompson and Venables themselves be safe if they were released? James Bulger's father has already said in public they'd be hunted down, and that does seem to be the view in Liverpool.
But the point I wanted to make was that someone's going to pop at them. Someone's going to have a go at them, and that's the point. Whatever happens, it will be discovered where they are, and we will be waiting for the headline in the paper that they have been killed. Oh, they will be killed. Wherever they go, they will be killed. We've got these draconian laws that are protecting these two when they come out, and in fact, the Internet will make a nonsense of that. Or, well, do, you not, yeah. or do you not agree? I mean, you... Well, I think you're right, because they're going to be haunted and hunted for the whole of their lives. Now, I think that, you know, Denise and Ralph will probably take some comfort from that. Um, and uh, who can blame them? Already there are stories that an up-to-date picture exists of Robert Thompson. A court order means television and newspapers can't publish it, but that doesn't mean it's not being circulated. The internet is almost impossible to police. It's not just websites, it's the huge volume of email traffic. Someone connected with the Justice for James campaign has emailed me the photograph. It's a picture of a teenage boy, and either side of it the original schoolboy photos of Thompson and Venables. So is this part of the campaign? I don't know of, of the uh, Justice for James campaign circulating any photographs. That's news to me. Really? Uh, I mean, I, I've got the photo. I can show it to you. I mean, you know, here you go. This was sent to me by someone from the campaign, and they got it from someone else in the campaign. I mean, this is a dangerous policy, isn't it? I mean, this is insane. That certainly um, is not anything to do with the Justice for James campaign. Um, it's nothing that I know of in terms of it being circulated certainly officially by anyone in the campaign. Uh, it's not um, official policy. It can't be published. Are you saying um, that's not something you'd approve of then, circulating Well, it's photograph. not for me to approve or, or otherwise. I, I don't... I mean, undoubtedly people are very angry in, in Kirby. But I mean, this uh, and, is... And, and, and in Liverpool like and worldwide. That. So, I don't know. I don't know what the photograph is I, and I don't know who circulated it. But lots of people know about it. The campaign recently held a fundraising evening at a Liverpool pub. James's mother, Denise, was there. £1,500 was raised. There was talk of using some of that as a reward for whoever tracked down the killers and displaying a picture of Robert Thompson as a wanted poster. So, I mean, just to clarify, Denise does not want them to be hunted down. She is certainly not encouraging anybody to do that. This photo uh, is there, I, isn't I think, it? Well, I don't know anything about that. You've just mm. shown it to me, so it's, it's a mystery to me. Will you be saying to people, look, whatever that photograph is, whether or not it's Thompson, stop circulating it, because it's a dangerous thing to start to do? I would have to say to them that they should not circulate it in Britain. Whether they decided that the internet was so big that it couldn't be stopped is a, is a matter for them. I wouldn't seek to tell people what to do. Um, it certainly wouldn't be done by the Justice for James campaign and it certainly wouldn't be done in this country. If somebody abroad wanted to do it, then we couldn't stop them. The internet is difficult to control, but so is a mood of retribution. We've discovered other teenagers in custody have already been mistaken for the Bulger killers and beaten up. And a woman in Wales was mistaken for one of their mothers. People threatened to firebomb her home. But is the picture Robert Thompson? Leon spent two years locked up with him. So, have a look at that. Is that him? It could be. The eyes and the eyebrows are like his, but it's not that clear. Just a face. You can't be certain? No. Is that because of the quality of the photograph? Or, yeah, or what? I can't really see the face anymore, but the face looks a bit like him. But it's just the body as well. But you can't be 100% no. certain? They were ten years old. James Bulger would be the same age now if they hadn't killed him. Whether his parents can ever forgive, only they can decide. The issue for the legal system is so much simpler. 
If Thompson and Venables are safe to be released, then it's time to let them out. I'd like to see Robus again. You know, and ask, like you know, I'd like to ask him why and what went wrong, and you know, could he have come to me and told me what he was doing? And you know, I'd talk to Robus. I wouldn't sort of tell him to go away because there's a reason for everything, isn't it?